watchers in the fourth dimension. If you could avoid killing anyone, it would help. I will try. Barusa! Call a meeting of the council at once. Ready? At once! No excuses! Get out! Hello and welcome back to Watchers in the Fourth Dimension. I'm Anthony. I'm Julie. And I'm Riley, and the discussion is for the wise or the helpless, and I am neither. This episode, we'll be seeing some double trouble over on Gallifrey. But before we get into that, Riley's going to take a quick look at the mail. Thank you. Let's start off with the discussion of the Daleks in Color episode. Citrine Dragonfly says, Cut down for time, in color, so RTD had to make Doctor Who and the Daleks just using the TV cast? I thought that was the whole point of the Peter Cushing movies. Why take an amazing seven-parter to make a film that came out not long after? I don't mind the idea of colorization, but the edits would drive me mad. Stick to shorter stories. I agree that The Rescue would be amazing for color treatment. Vicky in color! Yes! (laughs) And now we have some more passionate viewpoints in the Daleks in color. Invictus Archive says, It was chopped to fuck, and the out-of-place music was so loud you couldn't hear the dialogue. Shame they went through all that coloring just to do a botched job of the entire thing. (laughs) <laughs> I don't disagree. Tony Mazzicillo says, I love the idea of this. Let's be honest, classic or not, the original dragged. Mm, it really needed mm. editing. That said, I tell you some passionate viewpoints here. That said, I agree that they went overboard. It felt like an extended trailer for the Daleks rather than a complete story. There was a middle ground that wasn't realized, maybe an hour 45 and seven hour 15. I did enjoy many of the attempts to cut scenes in a more modern way rather than a stage show being filmed. Again, love the idea, but it needed a bit more restraint. Hit or miss. Totally on board with the colorization. Most modern viewers need that. And even as an old schooler, I thought it was cool touch. Love the updated special effects. Absolutely loved it. More of this, please. The music, meh. I'm on board with the concept, but more care should be taken for the new score to fit the era. A Connery-era James Bond pastiche would have been fantastic. Late 1980s synth was totally confusing. Overall, I think it's a great idea and would love for it to continue. I just hope they take a few lessons from this maiden voyage going forward. It has the potential to be a wonderful reinterpretation of old chestnuts. I think there's some fair points there. Don't know if I agree with the cutting scenes to appear more modern because it was shot like a stage show like we discussed before and it just doesn't work. There's no material to make those cuts for it to make sense or make an outlook jumpy. But that's just yeah. me, maybe. No, I agree with you, Riley. Completely yeah. agree. Kieran James Evans says, nice to hear from Diana again. I miss on the rocks. Woo. As for the Daleks in color, I find it neither one thing or the other. Old fans are going to find it grating and our new fans are going to want to watch other classic who after watching it. I doubt it. The music is particularly messy with some of the original score and then the newer style fighting it. And yes, very loud, just like Murray Gold. That was really nice to call it Diana there. Yeah, we enjoyed having her on the show. Yeah, we all miss on the rocks. Okay. Now we have some people talking about Image of the Fendal. First up is Austin D. Patterson. I've been listening to some old episodes of you guys lately, and I can't remember who, but someone predicted that Colby would be Julie's next crush. When I got to the part of the episode where Anthony and Julie started straight up bashing him, and Julie said, quote, I don't want him in my chest count, I was like, yeah, we should stop trying to predict Julie's crushes. Also, Riley, I'm disappointed. I was so excited to hear you go ham on bashing the part where the doctor looks straight into the camera and goes, time's running out. I think there was so much crazy shit going on at the end of the image of the Fendal that that was the lowest one on my list. (laughs) (laughs) Doctor Who 60s, 70s, and 80s says, you may have had some hot takes lately, but I'm with you guys on this one. I want to like it, but despite my rewatches, I don't have the first idea of what's actually happening. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Agreed. <laughs> the Twelfth Rising says Image of the Findal is the second best serial in season 15 after Horror Fang Rock. The first three episodes are excellent, but the fourth episode is less effective when Benedict Cumberbatch's mother goes disco. <laughs> <laughs> Mark Dunstan says, okay, story entertaining enough, but shoddy production values. Worse to come in this season. Much worse. Hmm. I wonder what he's talking about. Leela is still the best. I will give it six salt cellars out of ten. Nicholas Rutherford says, this is the only story of the season I don't remember from the original broadcast, which is strange as it is now one of my favorites of the season. It's atmospheric and fun. I love the doctor greeting the cows with morning ladies. And Ted Moss thinking Leela has escaped from a lunatic asylum. In the mid-90s, I worked with Jeff Hensliff, Jack Tyler's daughter, Gabby, 
So this reminds me of that period of my life too. So I have a soft spot for it. That's quite interesting. I would love if our <laughs> listeners had these kind of connections to old episodes like that. That would be amazing. We would love to hear it. Keith Burton says, it was eye-opening hearing how jumbled and incomprehensible this serial is to new viewers coming to it fresh. You'll be pleased to hear that Terrence Dix obviously shared your frustrations when he came to novelize the story. As was often the case, the master storyteller explained away the mysteries and inconsistencies with a few deft clicks of his typewriter. The dog, here we go, the dog was named after anthropologist Louis Leakey, and the door opens because the doctor kicks it so hard something breaks inside. He also explains succinctly the Fendall's history and motives. Whether you were a viewer, a reader, or a member of the production team, one thing was always true. You could always rely on dicks to sort it out. (laughs) 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 Damn dicks. R.L. Gray says, once again, I am dismayed at the disconnect between myself and the watchers. This is a favorite in my household. We love the slow build, the pervasive sense of dread. The interactions between the scientists and the folk occult themes done much better here, in my opinion, than in the demons. Whoa. Mm. Them's fighting words. Hard disagree. Yes. Yes. (laughs) We go on. My partner and I want a big finished spinoff series in which Adam Colby teams up with Leela, Jack, and Mother Tyler to solve supernatural science mysteries. Uh, Uh, Maybe. Eh. Maybe. A few notes. While I can accept Leela might just take a nap on the floor of the console room, I require an explanation for Colby's line, quote, you must think my head zips up the back. I think that implies that he says that the person who he's speaking to believes that he's some sort of puppet or that he's full of stuffing. That's my take on it, but I might be wrong. Anyway, perhaps Dr. Fennelman with his questionable accent is from the same place as Dr. Everett Von Scott of Rocky Horror fame. Yes. <laughs> You'll be pleased to know Leaky made it to a farm upcountry where he lived happily, (gasps) chasing the rabbits of Watership down. (laughs) Oh, no. (laughs) Oh, boy. Oh, boy. I was so excited and then very sad. Yes. As a devotee of the complexities of ancient alien and occult folklore, I maintain this story makes no less sense than actual specimens of that stuff, or indeed many other Doctor Who stories, particularly under Stephen Moffat. I think that's a fair statement. Anthony, you know more about the occult than we do. Do you agree? No. (laughs) (laughs) Well, okay then. To be honest, despite all my interest in the esoteric and the occult, I've never bought into ancient aliens at all. So anything with that theory, I will take a hard stance of disagree. Tony Mozzicello says, as a kid, I was frequently scared by Doctor Who. Behind the sofa was a major factor in my love for the show. That said, there were two stories that went above and beyond and absolutely terrified me. I'm talking tears and sleep lost terror. The first was the seat of doom. This was the second. In both cases, it was the transformation that struck a raw nerve. Possessed Thea in her final form scared the crap out of me. I think it was the eyes more than anything. They're so obviously painted on now, but to eight-year-old me in 1977, it was convincing and horrifying. So yeah, Image of the Fendal holds a special place in my heart. It was a very good swan song for the gothic era of the show. I'll give it nine people who behaved as if the earth were flat out of ten. I love stories like that, because that was my very, very first response to anything Doctor Who, which I've gone to that story many, many times, but I love hearing that type of story from other people. So if anyone else has more of those, please send them in. Yeah, and I think I'm kind of from that page as well. As a kid seeing Doctor Who on British TV as repeats, anything that's involved humans transforming into anything that wasn't human scared the hell out of me. I did not see Image of the Fendal until I was a teenager. So by then, I didn't care as much. Yeah. Sorry, everyone. I started watching Doctor Who in college. (laughs) And that was New Who. Sorry. (laughs) David Gordon says, Interesting to hear such comments about a story that I always thought of as highly regarded in fan circles. Just goes to show what a broad church Who fandom is. That said, I found it difficult to argue with a lot of the comments. However, I think I have finally solved the problem as to who released the doctor from the cupboard. Just hear me out as it does make some sense, possibly. Here's the situation. From the time that the doctor is locked up to his point of escape, Colby, Ransom, Fennelman, and Stahl are all otherwise occupied. Leela, Jack, and Martha don't know where he is, and Mitchell and the other security guards basically wouldn't. Therefore, there is only one person that could have possibly let him out, and I am of course talking of Clara Oswald. Yes, once she steps into the vortex in the name of the Doctor, one of her splintered selves turns up at Fetch Priory in 1978 and lets him out. That's my headcanon 
from now until something comes up with something better. Stop making her that important. She's not. <laughs> oh, don't be mean to Clara. I've heard worse theories. I'll put it like that. Okay, that's fair. I can allow that one. All right. Guy Lambert says, it's interesting listening to your show since episode one and feeling the mood shift as errors don't quite work for you. Early cranky Pertwee being a good example. I can really sense a change as you've entered season 15 and you all start to subconsciously feel that something isn't quite the same anymore. For me, it feels like a sudden shift from high-end drama goals to Saturday night BBC One Entertainment antics. Something that Tom Baker's performance really starts to demonstrate around here. Hmm. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, and to finish up, our good friend R. Alan Seiler says, This is definitely the weakest of Bauscher's three scripts. At least we have an explanation for it, i.e. Blake 7. So I live with the belief that had Bauscher had the time to finish it, it would be the equal of Face of Evil and Robots of Death. There are so many great ideas here and so many wonderful characters that the ingredients are in place to create a classic. This comes close. I actually enjoy it more than the Watchers seem to have. and It's my second favorite story of the season. And for me, that is carried mainly by Tom, Louise, and Daphne Hurd, who is this story's MVP as Mother Tyler, who might well be my favorite character of the season. Speaking of Louise, I adore Leela in the story. The thing that makes me most sad is that the fabulous Wanda Vinham is woefully underused in this, spending most of her time possessed or transformed. She makes one further appearance in Who that isn't much better than this. I will give this one a six grazing cows with time scanners out of ten. And finally, why was this episode not titled Tom Baker's Sex Face? <laughs> so, I will leave you guys with that image, and that's the end of the mail. Thank you, Riley. As a reminder, we really do love hearing your feedback, thoughts, comments, and questions. And as you've just heard, we do try to read out as many as possible on the show. So please do get in touch. You can contact us through Facebook, Instagram, and the platform formerly known as Twitter at watches 4 d or you can email us at watches 4 d at gmail.com. Additionally, we would absolutely love it if you subscribe to the podcast, if you don't already, and if you dropped us a review or rating on your podcast platform of choice. All right, taking things behind the scenes with the invasion of time. Unsurprisingly, this story has a troubled production. On joining the show halfway through the season, new script editor Anthony Reid became responsible for the final two stories. For the season finale, Producer Graham Williams wanted to further explore Gallifrey and society and mythology, building on the vision that previous script editor Robert Holmes had worked on with The Deadly Assassin. Of course, he sought approval from Holmes, and Holmes approved of this idea. And not only that, but he gave his permission and his blessing to bring back the character of Barusa. To write the season finale, Reed recruited David Weir, who had contributed to two shows that Reed had previously produced. The Troubleshooters and the Lotus Eaters. Reed and Weir started working on a storyline that introduced the concept that not all of Gallifrey's inhabitants were Time Lords. Weir was commissioned to write a story called Killers of the Dark, in which a race of cat people would be introduced who lived outside of the Time Lord capital, <sighs> whose society was to be <laughs> defined by both brutal savagery and technological sophistication. Assigned to direct this was veteran director Gerald Blake, who we had previously seen directing season five's The Abominable Snowman. Both Blake and Reed quickly became very concerned about the feasibility of Weir's scripts. The production team was under strict instructions from the BBC to cut the show's budget, which became even more challenging as Britain's inflation rates skyrocketed, meaning that the show had significantly less money than they thought they did. Weir's vision included elements such as a forum the size of Wembley Stadium full of cat people, for the benefit of our American listeners, Wembley Stadium is England's national football stadium, and that's football with a round ball that's kicked with, you know, the feet. <laughs> anyway, the old Wembley Stadium that existed at the time of filming had a capacity of around 100,000 people. So even without this budget crunch, I'm not quite sure how Mr. Weir thought that he would be able to make this happen. So, with little other choice... Given the way these scripts were going, Williams and Reed decided to abandon Killers of the Dark, meaning that a replacement had to be commissioned as quickly as possible. On top of this, the BBC appeared to be heading towards another round of strike action from its employees. Christmas programming was given priority over absolutely everything else, and so it became clear that the story would only be guaranteed one studio block, 
which is two less than would normally be given to a six-part story. As a result, the BBC suggested that season 15 could end with Underworld, and the budget left over could then be reallocated to the next season. But Williams and Reed, for some unknown reason, were absolutely determined to complete the season as planned. To do this, they decided to persevere with their plan to develop a sequel to The Deadly Assassin, which would save them money by reusing sets and costumes from that story. However, they also had to avoid using any story elements that could be considered to be derived from Killers of the Dark. Williams and Reed initially approached Robert Holmes to see if he would write the serial. And he said, thanks, but no thanks. <laughs> With time running out, our producer and script editor decided that they had to write the story themselves. Williams and Reed developed the storyline for the invasion of time over a long weekend. Seeking advice from Holmes, he suggested that the story should be structured as the marriage of one four-part story and one two-part story, just as he had overseen previously with The Seeds of Doom. He also gave the new production team permission to use the Sontarans, who were a favourite of Williams, apparently. <laughs> to make up for the two cancelled studio blocks, the production team decided to take advantage of an emergency fund which would allow for two weeks' worth of recording on outside broadcast videotape. Williams and Reed would have to structure their story to account for this, and they decided to set a large part of the story within the infinite space of the TARDIS itself. With the storyline in place, Reed completed the initial drafts for the scripts within just two weeks. Williams then spent a week doing Reed's job as script editor and contributed a substantial amount of material to the final two parts. Initially, Reed and Williams sought a joint attribution for the scripts, but the BBC refused this, insisting that a pseudonym be used for the two of them. After the initial suggestion of Richard Thomas, which was the name of Williams's young son, the head of serials Graham MacDonald decided that David Agnew would receive the credit. This was a fairly common pseudonym that the BBC had been using since the beginning of the 70s. Williams and Reed also had to deal with not just one, but two companion departures. First and foremost was the departure of Leela. Louise Jameson had been insistent that she would leave at the end of the season ever since she announced it in a press conference at the beginning of the season. However, Williams remained ever optimistic that he would be able to change her mind. Sadly, <laughs> he failed. This caused an abrupt end to be written for her because Williams had been anticipating a last minute rewrite to retain her. <laughs> Having Leela remain on Gallifrey with Andred was a disappointment to Jameson, who was hoping to see her character written out in a blaze of glory, dying to save the Doctor or something like that. However, the production team decided that this would be way too traumatic for the show's younger viewers. <sighs> Fine. Also planned to be written out was K-9, as the prop had posed filming problems ever since its introduction <laughs> in The Invisible Enemy. <laughs> However... The production team decided that they could use this opportunity to introduce an improved version of the prop. And so, the original K-9 decides to remain on Gallifrey with Leela, while K-9 Mark II was introduced at the end of the story to reassure viewers that their favourite robotic pooch would be back. How could they afford that if they couldn't afford other things? Probably because they can spread the cost out, you know, cost accounting and all that. Anyway, when it came to production... Blake rounded out his behind-the-camera team with two new faces. Firstly, designer Barbara Gosnold, who makes her only contribution to Doctor Who. She's also known for her work on the Oneidan line, It Ain't Half Hot Mum, and, of course, everyone's favourite, Zed Cars. <laughs> Secondly, costume designer Dee Kelly makes the first of three contributions to the show. She was also professionally known as Dee Robson, and she also worked on Moonbase 3, Blake 7, and The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy 11. Just joking, there's no number on the end of that last one. And of course, this era of the show wouldn't be complete without production unit manager John Nathan Turner and, of course, composer Dudley Simpson, who makes his 51st contribution to the show. Wow. Filming for this lasted around six weeks, starting at the beginning of November 1978 and wrapping up in mid-December and the final version of the story was broadcast on subsequent Saturdays between February the 4th and March the 11th, 1978. And that last episode, of course, brings season 15 to a close. And with that, we move into our short summary, which is with me this episode. The Doctor returns to Gallifrey, where he immediately turns into the biggest dick possible. It is the <laughs> planet of the dicks, of course. <laughs> Claims the presidency, yells at Barusa, exiles Leela and allows the Vardens to invade. 
Of course, the whole thing is an act and the Vardens are swiftly defeated. To be honest, it's a surprise they were a threat at all because after the way the Doctor talked them up, they first manifest as sheets of aluminium foil and then as Flash Gordon's <laughs> lamest adversaries. Yeah. Everyone cheers, but of course then the aluminium foil opens up and you get everyone's favourite baked potatoes, the Sontarans, for a secondary invasion. We then see them running up and down some corridors before the Doctor zaps them with the DMAT gun, bringing the story to a close. What a fucking waste of time. <laughs> Tell me how you really feel. <laughs> you, now you all know how I feel about it. I'm wow, going to let you guys wow. talk. All right. Okay. Part one. One of the first things that the doctor does, he's talking with these individuals who are sitting in chairs. Yes, chairs. There's more chairs to come. Do you want to talk about them, Julie? <laughs> I will talk about them. But one of the things he says is, I am prepared. And my mind immediately said, prepared for what? For the death of the king. <laughs> This is how my mind works. Sorry, everyone. But also that made me very sad because the rest of it was not The Lion King. <laughs> I don't know where to start with this serial. <laughs> and apparently they didn't either. Because what the hell is this opening? I know I have been accused. And actually, I believe all of us have put forth this criticism of the show in which they reveal... The mystery too early. <laughs> but here, <laughs> you're giving absolutely nothing, absolutely nothing for the first two episodes. And it's just utterly ridiculous. It's really, there has to be a better way of how they could set this up and still maintain the mystery. Some way, somehow, I'm not the writer, it's on them. But it was one of those things where I press play. My Brit box starts on Amazon Prime, and I turn over to get my computer and open it to start taking notes for what I'm about to watch. And when I'm only two minutes in, after what I've seen, I start asking, wait, did I press episode two, not episode one of the serial? <laughs> That's just really poor. I mean, damn. Yeah, I'm not a fan of the beginning. We then have the doctor come in to the TARDIS and be a dick. And mm -hmm. then when he is left and everything, Leela was really mean to K-9 and had him pouting. And that is just not the relationship that Leela and K-9 have. So that made me very sad. What's the psychological term for that? The, um... Nagging? <laughs> no, no, not... <laughs> no, basically, a person gets bullied by their boss and then goes home and kicks the dog. It's like the oh, stereotypical mm, yeah. example. That's basically what's happened here. And it's all the Doctor's fault, is what I'm saying. Yes. <laughs> yeah. The Doctor is completely unlikable for the first few episodes. Right. He is rude to everyone. He's particularly awful to Barusa. I mean, Barusa's a Time Lord, and Ergo, as we've discussed before, he's clearly a dick, but mm -hmm. even an absolute dick doesn't deserve that kind of treatment. Anyway. Agreed. But hey, the FX were for the ships were pretty good, right? <laughs> yeah, because Graham Williams was obsessed with not being shown up by Star Wars at this point. So... <laughs> I do want to note a continuity error at the beginning. When the Doctor is on the Varden ship, talking to the Vardens, he is wearing his scarf. When he heads back into the TARDIS, the scarf is miraculously on the hat stand and not around the Doctor's neck. Anyway, those are the yes. stupid things I know. And separately, while the model work looks good, this version of Gallifrey looks cheap. The walls are creased. <laughs> It's just really yeah. humid. <laughs> I mean, it's so obvious they've completely run out of money by this point. Yes. Okay, let's move on to some new things and more things to discuss. We move on to new characters, and we have a commander who's being bullied by his boss. Surprise, surprise. And the Castellan. Ah, uh, yes. He's actually one of the better characters in this, but he is the absolute dick. Oh, yeah. He's so punchable. <laughs> <laughs> but he's so good at it. Yeah. To be fair, kudos to Milton Johns, who played him, who has done a phenomenal job in three different Doctor Who stories as playing shifty, sniveling <laughs> people. I mean, he was Bennick in The Enemy of the World, and then oh, wow. he was Guy Crayford in The Android Invasion. And here he is here playing possibly his shittiest character of them all. <laughs> oh, boy. He's great. He is great. I think he's fantastic in this. He's so good. And honestly, like, my notes are all over the place because since we can't really figure out even what the mystery is because 
how they give us nothing <laughs> to go off of. I'm just trying to capture every single little thing as possible, trying to make sense of everything, but it's very difficult to do so, right? Yeah. Oh, but hey, jelly babies. Yes, lots jelly of babies, them. lots of them. I'm not even sure how to count how many we get in this. <laughs> yes. We start off here with Android being offered a jelly baby. So that's plus one. So let's just try and keep count of this as we go. We'll see what we end up with. Well, yeah. there's it- another offer in part one. So let's might as well say there's two. So we're at two so far. All right. Ding, ding. I want to talk about the humor in this because some of it works. And mm-hmm. some of it is just not great. When the doctor says to Android, you lead, and Android responds with, no, you follow me. I actually thought that was really funny. <laughs> that's pretty good. I found that the humor got better as the serial went along. Maybe yeah. it was just the disruption of the poor opening. And I feel like that's going to be a theme of my comments while talking about the serial is that I do feel that as it goes on, it does improve itself. And I think it might be what you were saying, Anthony, in regards to two separate serials combined into one, a four-parter and a two-parter. And so when we get to a two-parter, we're more direct. We know where we are. We're more concise. We know what's happening. (laughs) We're going to come back to that because I would argue that this is the rare example of a story that really peaks in the middle. (laughs) Really? (laughs) Okay. Interesting. Interesting. Mm. Well, yeah, I would like to bring up a nomination I know we might be jumping forward a little bit in this particular episode. I'd like to nominate for best use of music for season 15 to be the processional march to name the doctor the president of the Time Lords. Oh, it's great. It's so pompous and regal. And there's something about it. And to me, and this is showing my age and my generation, it sounds like the music you hear when you beat a Final Fantasy game on the Super Nintendo. (laughs) (laughs) Amazing. And while that's a slight jab at it, it's just a nostalgia and there's something sweet about it too. So I do enjoy that. And also I do like the whole ritual of it, the sash of Rassilon, the rod of Rassilon, the great key of Rassilon, the brand new car of Rassilon. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. And just to hit on the music one, because we were going a little bit everywhere, is when Leela is picking out outfits, it's wonderful. Oh, yeah. And then hers just discarding all of them because they're terrible. I'm like, yes, yes, they are, Leela. They weren't good. (laughs) And one thing I love, and sorry if I'm going in a direction not everyone was going, but we have these aliens. I don't know that we learned that they're actually the Vardens yet. I no, we don't. Yeah, yes. we don't have a name yet. Yeah, they are sitting there in the background watching things as they happen, and they say that the Doctor understands discipline. (laughs) <laughs> which we all know is false but immediately right after the time lords say that he doesn't have any yeah and they did that a couple of times where they went back and forth between someone saying one thing and then cut to a different person saying something of the opposite that i found fun they didn't keep going with it i'm a little sad about that if they had continued that not all the time But if they had made reference to those type of things throughout, that would have been fun. That's just a little bit of a bit that comes up in science fiction. I really do enjoy the cutaways to aliens observing the Mm. events of what's going on. I always think of The Simpsons, Kang, and Kodos. (laughs) Silly earthlings. It's almost MST3K as well. Yes. Yes. (laughs) I guess we should move on to part two because this bad boy holds six parts. (laughs) We gotta get through them. One line very quickly that I love, which was when Andred said to Leela, if you could avoid killing anyone, it would help. And Leela just <laughs> oh, responds with, yes. I will try. <laughs> After uh. she had taken her knife back. I love that. Anyway, we end with the investiture. The coronet of Rassilon goes on the doctor's head and he keels over in agony as the coronet does its thing. And that's our cliffhanger. And we're into part two. One thing I'm happy about is they were good about pretty much every recap. Which I was almost surprised at because these episodes were long. Yeah, they were. They were all at the 25 minute mark, which we don't always get. I have a question for you, Julie, on that. And it's not so much for part two, but certainly parts five and six. Would you have taken longer recaps if it had meant less padding? (laughs) (laughs) Yes. (laughs) Yes, there was lots of padding all over. This did not need to be a six parter. Agreed. Agreed. If we could have had a five-parter for Underworld and a five-parter here, I would have been really happy. Was it a cruel joke by the writers 
that within the first seven spoken lines of part two, there's a line that says, we may well have to go through this whole boring business in the very near future. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> Probably. Oh, God. And it was in part two here where I realized, oh, no, I think Tom Baker and Louise Jamison are in a bad state right now because it seems like they weren't together at all for the first two episodes other than the very first scene or second scene of the first part. They seem so separate on their own little journeys again, which seems to happen so often with them. But the effort to exile Leela and Leela running off results in finding another lady on Gallifrey. Ah, oh, I true. know. And I love Rodan. I love how she gives zero fucks about everyone looking for Leela. <laughs> I mean, she literally says that's their problem. She's awesome. She has like one minor fault to her character. And I'm like, well, that just makes her like an actual person. So I can forgive some of that just of how useless she is. But there's a reason why. <laughs> so it makes sense. <laughs> well, she's useless until she's able to be mind controlled. And then she does the thing oh, for the doctor. But we'll get there. Uh, well, yeah, yeah, we'll get there. But my thought in a lot of this is first off, the Time Lords, minus the Doctor, are going to hold Leela prisoner for what I don't know. They say it's because they think she's the one who hurt the president. That doesn't make sense at all. <laughs> <laughs> if they had structured it slightly differently to where she had approached him before he started hurting, then maybe. But no, no, I'm sorry. I couldn't be on board with that. Yeah, it's pretty sloppy there. And I think you and me, Anthony, are at least agree on this part in that before you believe this story peaks in the middle, I believe the story just keeps improving as it moves along. But we both seem to agree that these first two episodes, woof, No bueno. No yeah, bueno, my no, friend. No, 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 no. <laughs> I was hurting pretty badly. And well, we'll save it when we get to the other parts, but I felt a relief. I felt better as I watched the serial. And that's a good thing instead of just staying on course, which it could have been. Oof. One note on episode two, the doctor gives Andred a jelly baby and then eats one himself and then gives Andred the rest of the bag. So last time we decided that a bag would equate to about 10 jelly babies. So mm -hmm. I'm going to mark this as another 12 jelly babies, which brings us up to 14 so far this story. Oh boy. Oh buddy. Now we know where the budget went. <laughs> yeah. The endless supply of jelly babies. Okay. I have, I think, two things that I really want to talk about. One is, are we breaking the fourth wall? Yes. Ooh. Okay. Yes, we are. And it's in this part, and we also do it in the last part. And it just weirds me out the way that they use it. Well, at least in the second episode, it wasn't an instance where I would think you would need to break the fourth wall. No, absolutely not. And this story is quite widely mocked for that. Oh. It's generally seen as the moment that Tom Baker's ego went a little mm. too out of control. Yes. Perfect. Next one. As I said, I want to talk about chairs. This is part two <laughs> of my three parts on chairs. <laughs> Why in the world are there just a bunch of random short plastic chairs scattered throughout Gallifrey, or at least in the Citadel? Julie, it's so funny you mentioned this because I noticed it in part three, which I had a specific <laughs> note here. Please ask Julie what she thought about the chairs in the hallway that Leela and Rodan go down because they are green, they are plastic, and they also appear to not have any legs. <laughs> so are they even chairs at this point? <laughs> oh, man. But really, this episode, part, whatever you want to call it, it's all just building up to get Leela out of the Citadel, Ruth wrote mm -hmm. in, and the Doctor still continuing to be a dick. Right. And it's just, and of course, everything he does is cloaked in mystery. I want you to put up lead in a specific way in my office, blah, 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 blah. No hint at where we're going. No idea. We just know there's three aliens out there that are watching. And that's it for two episodes. Anything else? Yeah, so part three part then? Three. Part three. <laughs> We've got the Time Lords being introduced to their new masters. We get some bits of aluminium foil. The Doctor cackles and that's our cliffhanger. And this, in part three, is where we find out that these are the Vardens. And the Doctor claims they have more power than the Time Lords can ever imagine and that they must submit as he has. In part three and in part four, I am just so extremely disappointed in the Vardens that I just cannot take them seriously. Oh yeah, that's shit. <laughs> <laughs> and while I enjoyed it minimally, 
the cliffhanger, I would like to point out that apparently, just in my little research, a writer of the site io9, which I don't know if that still exists anymore, I remember it many, many years ago, a critic there named Charlie Jane Anders listed the cliffhanger to episode two that we've just mentioned, in which the doctor appears to have turn sides and is favoring the Vardens as one of the greatest cliffhangers in the history of the program. What? <laughs> I mean, do we honestly believe that was going to be the big moment in the entire series that the show shifts? I'm like, you know, we were following a hero around. Let's make him a villain moving forward. What the hell? What type of criticism is that? That's just insane. Long-term listeners take a shot at this point. This is something <laughs> Sandifer talks about. <laughs> Yay! Oh yeah! And she says that the Doctor hasn't been this unpredictable, leaving the viewer uncertain on what he's doing or whose side he's on since the early Hartnell era. Mm, yeah, but it was just done in a better way, I guess. Yeah. With Hartnell, it wasn't sitting there like this big covered dish and you didn't know what was underneath it. It was with him, it was like what he was doing in the background outside of the other events of the series that were also majorly moving along. It was like his little back and forth. And also he'd been established since the beginning as kind of unpredictable. I mean, one of the mm -hmm. first things he does is kidnap two school teachers from 1963. In the second <laughs> story, he sabotages the TARDIS so he can explore the Dalek city. Here, the Doctor was cuddly, friendly fourth Doctor during Underworld, and then suddenly you've got what appears to be a radically different character. There's no build to it. It all just seems so sudden. Right. So I agree with you, Riley. I don't think it's well established. I would imagine for the casual viewer, you think that there's something going on here and that it's a ruse of some kind, which is exactly what it is. Right. Yeah. I don't think it's very well thought out and everything. And one redeeming thing that happens in this story is the interactions between the Doctor and Barusa. Yes. yes. As soon as they're behind closed doors with the lead-lined office, we get to see the Doctor and Barusa's actual relationship. And I love Barusa. I think Barusa is a wonderful, wonderful character in this. Yeah, the version of Barusa we get here is a lot better than the one we got in The Deadly Assassin. Okay, to speed things along, we get <laughs> Leela going out to the Barbarian Garden. The, outer the Wastelands, Outer Gallifrey, <laughs> with Rodan. Plus one to the quarry count. Yes. <laughs> I love when they run into those, I guess, ousted Time Lords. When they size them up and they realize Leela can handle herself, and they look at Rodan and they say, like, she can't fend for herself. And she says, I love how she seems so exasperated about having to fend. I think she even says, to fend? Yes. Yeah, and it's she breaks down thing. and she's in total, <laughs> total culture shock. No one said anything about fending. <laughs> I also love one of the comments when they went out into the world. It was, it's so, so natural. Well, yeah, it's outside. <laughs> <laughs> it's very Brave New World. Mm, yeah. And the yeah. reaction to that, I thought that was a nice kind of little tie to that. That yeah. really worked for me. Yes. Well, we have another moment of wonderful humor and arguably, I think, maybe the best of the entire season that is right here, where the doctor with tremendous gravitas asks for a jelly baby, <laughs> specifically an orange jelly baby. <laughs> He's actually having Castellan feed them to him. <laughs> he is totally manipulating Kellner through this. He knows what Kellner's doing. He knows that Kellner is a piece of shit who's going to betray anyone if it means he can eventually seize power. And so what he does is he tells him, I'm going to make you acting vice president. Go and make up some lists of subversive time lords that you can persecute because they've wronged you at some point. Everything he's doing is just to manipulate Kellner, and Kellner doesn't even realize it. Oh, yeah. It's a masterclass. That's another element. Again, we were talked about the Dacia and Barusa, but right there is another great back and forth that's really enjoyable throughout the serial. And like I said, this is part of it. This is the argument I'm putting forward. As we progress, the serial gets better. Yeah. I actually really like this episode. I think this is really clever because the Doctor tells Kellner to make these lists and then has them expelled, where the Doctor knows Leela is outside of the city and Leela is going to organize this uprising. It's really, really intelligent. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. 
I do also want to give a shout out of the doctor offering the Vardens a jelly baby. So I think there's the non-existent orange one, which I'm still going to count. And then the Vardens. <laughs> so that's another two. <laughs> so many jelly babies. But we get towards the end and the doctor uses canine's tail as a hat rack. Poor canine. <laughs> there's a hat stand in the TARDIS as well. Yes. And then is K9 going into the Matrix? Is that what was happening? Yeah. Okay. Just double check. Yeah. Part four ish? Part four. So Andred comes into the TARDIS ready to execute the doctor. I sentence you to death, traitor. And that's our cliffhanger. And immediately K9 to the rescue, stunning Andred. Not in the dick, Not- though. Surprising. <laughs> Not in the dick. Well, because we know that he can't lose that because Leela's going to stay. So. Um, <laughs> uh, no! No! Oh, Come on, Julie, God. don't upset Riley. <laughs> Spoilers. Oh, mm. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm going to move past that and think about happy things. And it's here in this episode where I feel like the humor really takes off. And it felt like so much of it was done through the use of smash cuts. I almost felt like I was in a 30 Rock episode. (laughs) Particularly the part that I really enjoyed is that when Kellner says, expedite immediately, I repeat that under the circumstances, I assume complete authority. The president is to be shot on sight. Smash cut the doctor to Andred. Take that. Hands him the sash. And that hands him the rod. This is a Bugs Bunny routine. It's the Mm -hmm. duck season, rabbit season thing. And he's doing it right there. And it's great. And that was just one in about maybe two or three others in this specific episode that I really enjoyed. But this is the one that really struck out to me. But it was very common and very, very funny. Yeah, it's done well. It is done well. And I would argue that this episode is the peak of this story. I would say we just keep going up. (laughs) We keep getting better every day. There's a few things that happened in this one that really disappointed me. And while I like most of it, just a few things I don't particularly care for. I have one where it sounds like the doctor is trying to explain what he's going to do to solve this whole problem. And he's going to find out where the Vardens live and then he's going to time loop it away. Can we stop on that for a second? Because I want you to think back. Three stories. What did the Doctor say the Time Lords were for putting the Fendal planet or Planet 5, whatever it was, in a time <laughs> Oh, yeah, here it is. Yep. He called it criminal behaviour. Yes. And what's he about to do? Yes. Put the Vardens in a time loop. You hypocrite, Doctor. It, uh, it's so frustrating when I don't particularly care for when they do this with the Doctor. When they have him say one thing and then episodes or even seasons later, it changes mm-hmm. because that really changes who the doctor is because the doctor is not that cruel. Mm-hmm. And yet time and time again, all of a sudden it's like, yeah, but this one time he's going to be. But really? He's got previous. He did this to Axos. Yeah. Just it's inconsistency. Yes. That's what it is. And it's frustrating. It's very frustrating. And there's other things that come up a little bit later in the serial that I could raise similar points to, which we will when we get there. Because guess what? There's still two more parts after this. <laughs> <laughs> Can I just talk about the Vardens and how lame they are? <laughs> yes. How useless yes, they are? Please do. Oh. All of a sudden, they're like, oh, well, we can materialize now because we're safe. And they're just fucking humans. (laughs) What the hell? (laughs) And they have no personality. They're just the worst. Right. And I kind of wonder, just trying to do some manner of repair here, maybe the reason why they're hiding behind aluminum foil is because they themselves realize how unintimidating and lame they look. (laughs) So they're like, we have to hide ourselves. No one would be threatened by us if we show our true selves. They don't come across as this credible threat in any way, shape or form. (laughs) They do, as I alluded to, look like the lamest adversaries ever faced in Flash Gordon. Yes. And there's something very wimpy about the idea of a villain or a threat that basically just hides Mm -hmm. until it's safe. I'm sorry, that's not scary or or threatening to me. It says it all when the doctor locks them out of his office and goes, ha 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 ha. Like, you've just shown how (laughs) shit these guys are. Right. (laughs) It's so bad. Uh, mm. But despite that, the delights in this are in the interaction between the Time Lords. Kellner is awful. He's immediately switched from supporting the Doctor to the Vardens. 
<laughs> he orders the doctor to be shot on sight at one point. He is just the worst and it's wonderful. Yes. You've got Leela's rabble and Leela being sexy as hell in her natural habitat, getting oh. angry at the ineptitude of the exiled Time Lords. She is so hot when she's mad. Agreed. Agreed. Don't need to hear any more from me about I it. I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> and at the end, the doctor encourages her on killing people. He is one of us. <laughs> yes, finally. It's only at the end that she was given free reign. Kind of sad, but sweet at the same time. The rabble that she's with, I feel like they were using some of the costumes from the mutants for those outsider Time Lords. That was uh, my a feeling when I saw them, but that would make sense. But uh, are we now with the universe's favorite baked potatoes <laughs> yes so our cliffhanger is k9 and the doctor banish the vardens thanks to some wonderful techno babble which saves the day and as the doctor gives his victory speech everyone just stops and stares because everyone's favorite baked potatoes have shown up behind the doctor and, and that's our cliffhanger and we're into part five it's so obvious it's like you just left a big giant hole in your defenses obviously shit is getting through like come on I agree with you, Julie, but I would argue that that was actually a good cliffhanger and much better than the cliffhanger at the end of part two. Oh, yeah, it's a good cliffhanger. It's just not thinking that something else could possibly come in when you, your defenses are down. Yeah. Let's talk about these new Sontarans. <sighs> okay. Firstly, we have a new costume, a new prosthetics, and I think they look awful. Yes. You mean the prosthetics that we got to see twice at a yes. point i thought they're never going to take those damn helmets off i wish they hadn't <laughs> they lost the makeup they couldn't find the prosthetic makeup anymore so they're just going to keep the helmets on them the entire time and how poor it was done around the eyes like when they had the mm -hmm. helmets on and you just see the prosthetic hanging off their face yeah what and the other thing is derek deadman who played store Deciding to do the whole thing in a South London accent. Oh, it was right. terrible. <laughs> he sounded like my old sergeant major from my days in the Air Cadets. It's half expecting him to go, pain is close to pleasure, therefore you should enjoy pain. Good lord. <laughs> but hey, we get duck tor. Oh. We get so much duck tor. <laughs> 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 the production team was so mad at how he decided to play it and he just refused to change it. Oh, wow. Oh, man. Wow. Oh, it was... Boy. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. <laughs> it's a shame that Kevin Lindsay had passed away by this point because Lynx and Steyer was so much better than Store. Oh, yes. So much. Okay. There's a few fun things that happen. The Castellan, Kellner, I guess, and the Centaurans where he keeps oh, trying okay. to say something and they just keep pushing him back and telling him to shut up. There were three consecutive scenes that ended with him <laughs> being thrown to the floor. That has to be intentional comedy. They are taking the piss to do that, to end a scene three times the exact same <laughs> yeah. way. They treat him so badly and yet this idiot, <laughs> this absolute bellend, decides he's going to ally himself with them. What is he doing? doing this is not the first time where i feel like we've had a character on who who basically just whoever is there at the moment they align themselves with no yeah. no thought just almost like imprinting on the next image <laughs> they see and what's amazing and to your point riley the sontarans see this sniveling little piece of shit they know exactly <laughs> what he is and they're gonna use him but they have oh, no yeah. time for him Right. But I will say that he does become somewhat effective for them towards the end. He does yeah. actually accomplish a few things, which is surprising. You would just think he'd be utterly useless. I want to know what happens to him at the end. <laughs> oh, oh Bruce is going to come up with something. It'll be fine. Yeah. All right. We get Leela being oh. amazing. Mm. <laughs> Riley, so you want to talk about that knife throwing? Yes, the knife throw. My God, the knife throw. <laughs> just, I don't know what was better. Just the way it was shot or the childlike joy <laughs> she had in her face after she completed such an accurate throw. It just made me so happy, even as I know we are marching towards the end, sadly. But it's just great. I feel like this, there's a couple other scenes that we had mentioned earlier. She has a good serial to go out on for her character. Granted, 
We'll get to how she ends up, but everything up to this point is a celebration of Leela, so to speak. And there's a lot of fun things that happen as they're running around trying to escape the Centaurans. There's a shot where the doctor is standing in front of them in a line and they all lean around the doctor to see past him. (laughs) (laughs) And I just thought that was adorable and kind of reminds me of a lot of things that either happen now or like kind of Scooby-Doo-esque. Yes, they definitely do that again later in part six as well with the doors. Mm -hmm. It's here where we have the two parts. Now we have the four part serial, so to speak. Now we have the two part. And here is just more direct. And it's basically a chase. It's just a chase around Gallifrey and around the TARDIS. And I don't know what it is about it. The sudden hiding behind offices, having conversations, then off we run again. There's something enjoyable about that sequence or that pattern to me that works really, really well and just feels more organic and more lively. And there's more of a sense of energy and tenseness compared to what we saw in the very first two episodes of the serial, where it is Everything's obfuscated. You don't know what's going on. We're not going to be fooled by the fact that like, what, now the doctor's evil? Give me a break. That would never happen. Now we have some energy and we're cooking. We're moving forward. We have some momentum. Yes, but also no, because I do find (laughs) in these two episodes, the endless running up and down the same corridors to be deeply tedious. Are you speaking of particularly in part six within the TARDIS going down the same stairs and around the corner? I mean, that's a playful little thing they're doing there. There are scenes in episode five of up and down corridors on Gallifrey as well. I mean, there's a lot of up and down corridors in the last two parts here. Yeah, but also at the same time, again, things are moving, things are happening, and it's usually done for a reason. And I can be more okay with that than... Again, I'm with Riley. I find the beginning more tedious than this. I think the beginning's tedious. I think the end's tedious. And I will reiterate, (laughs) this peaks with episodes three and four. Yeah, if the Vardens weren't so disappointing, I might agree with you. But they were so disappointing that I just can't. What I do like about episodes three and four, you do see here, and that's the interaction between some of the good characters. Barusa and the Doctor in part five form just this magnificent double act. And it's bizarre. Watching through this, I was like, I'd kind of like Barusa to jump aboard the TARDIS for a couple of stories after this, maybe? I would prefer him to be on the TARDIS, but he doesn't go on the adventure with them. He's just there <laughs> when they come back and they kind of tell them a little bit what happened and he just says a few snide remarks or something like that for humor. That would be good. He's just kind of bitchy at the beginning and the end. Just very catty, yeah. And every once in a while, they jump into the TARDIS in the middle of the story, and he's just sitting there, and he's like, you still haven't figured it out yet? These guys. (laughs) I like that. I like that. Almost playing the part of a Greek chorus. (laughs) But what is strange with the interaction between the Doctor and Perusa, did anyone else feel a little weirded out of the Doctor threatening him at gunpoint? Yes. And that's not the first time he uses a gun or points it at people. In this serial. Barusa also pulls a gun on the Doctor in this episode, so... True. Just to touch on Barusa being the bitchy comic (laughs) relief at the beginning and end of the story, it would be even better if he was played by Kenneth Williams. (laughs) Oh my god. Oh my god. Oh my god. That would be... Wow. All right. I also love how the Doctor trusts Leela with the key. Oh, again. So he gets the key of Rassilon from Barusa, who had it the whole fucking time. And it's not even an impressive one. It's no. literally the key to his drawer. Amazing. <laughs> it's the worst. I so wanted it to be not just a key. But I love how the Doctor trusts Leela with it. Out of everyone, and there's even a, you're going to trust it to an alien? He's like, yeah, damn right I am. Right. Once again, it's a good celebration. It's a love shown towards the character of Leela as this is her last serial. It's another one of those spots. And it was enjoyable. And I love how he trusts Rodan to rewire the TARDIS to fix the hole in the force field around Gallifrey. And he assists her. And Mm -hmm. he tries to give exposition while she's doing it. And she just ignores him and keeps going. I love Rodan when she is in her natural habitat. I love that. I also love when she's like, have you got a screwdriver? Wonderful. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Also, Storm, we need to talk about his anger issues because punching <laughs> holes in machinery, mm, mm, <laughs> buddy, no. And of course, we end the episode with Kellner destabilizing the TARDIS. Rodan is knocked out. Everything turns negative and shaky. And that's our cliffhanger. <laughs> and we're into part six. And we have negative film mania. I yes. was worried how long it was going to last. To be honest. 25 minutes, Julie, the entire episode (laughs) in negative. 
Please enjoy. Please don't. Oh. Uh. I do love that one of the comments, I forget who even said this, but it said, bring the relevant probe with you. <laughs> <laughs> yep. We all know where that's going. <laughs> but Castellan just making all the wrong choices. All the wrong choices. Oh, yeah. He's an idiot. I mean, he's doing his best trying to match wits with the doctor. And the Centaurs, of course, have to rely on him because he's the only one familiar with this Time Lord technology. And as we move from a runabout of Gallifrey in part five, now we move into a runabout within the TARDIS. And I'm not too keen on the idea of seeing so much of the back rooms of the TARDIS, especially when it looks like a water treatment facility. <laughs> yeah, it was a mix of a disused hospital and of a swimming pool in the basement of an office block. Wow. So wow. that was their emergency offsite filming fund for those two weeks were these locations. See, this is one of those things where maybe that should be something that should always be veiled and left up to the viewer's imagination. Because it's just a good gag. It's a good joke of what is within the TARDIS. But that's just me. I didn't mind seeing the pool in part one when Leela's in the pool. But that's it. I kind of agree. I tend to not like to see all of the TARDIS. But on occasion, they'll show little clips, right? In like 10 era, you see the closet that he gets all of his outfits from. Okay, I'm yeah. okay with seeing a closet and like a pool, but I don't need to sit here and get a full layout in a random statue where just we just automatically know that there's a thing on the statue that then takes away artwork. I don't understand. <laughs> but I digress. But at least now in our new version of the show where Bruce is on the show every single week, we now know where he'll be <laughs> hanging out at the pool. Reading old issues of the Daily Mirror. Yes. <laughs> well, now we're getting to another element that I'm not too keen on in part six, and we brought it up briefly earlier, and that is the hypnotism again. <sighs> not great. Why? Why? I know it's easier than maybe having to write something for the character to say that convinces the other character how important it is. Maybe that's too much effort than just saying, you're hypnotized now, boogity boogity boo, and that's it. That just seems lazy. Well, and when I first saw it, I thought that she just didn't know what it was because K-9 had the schematics in that she would have just built whatever K-9 said and not have to be hypnotized, but just as a, I don't know what we're building, but this is what the dog is telling me to do, so I'm just going to do it. I would have even been okay with that. And I think the whole point was just so that she didn't remember it. That's literally the only reason to hypnotize her. No one can know how to build this DMAT gun because it's so terrible, even though we've literally seen other guns that do the exact same thing <laughs> at previous points in the show's history. <laughs> Looking at you, Day of the Daleks, with your disintegrating rays. Guess what? Guess <laughs> what? I have Chairs Part 3. Oh. Chairs Part 3, let's do it. Chairs Part 3. Yeah. We've got... Hang on, Julie, hold up. i got to stop you there. you got to say it. I want to talk about chairs. There we go. There we go. So we're in the pool area and the Santarans catch up with them and the Santaran starts throwing chairs oh. <laughs> at them. Oh, it's also at the pool area. Yes. I'm pretty sure that the Santaran that's chasing Andred, that looked like he accidentally landed on the chair and slipped and fell. And Andred throws a chair at him as well. I mean, there's yes. a lot of chairs going on here. There's chairs going on. There's falling. It's just madness. And it's wonderful. And I'm so glad I get to talk about chairs again. It's all you ever want. <laughs> And also, we have this chase. Is The chase is silly. Within oh uh, You said earlier, Julie, it's Scooby-Doo. I had a good time. The door joke, everyone go through a different door. Then all of a sudden, we're actually in the same room, despite going through different doors, the different sides of the hallway. That was very Scooby-Doo. I'm with you yes. on that, Riley. Mm -hmm. And actually, I liked that. Yeah, it was fun. There's the garden and the doctor doing what I guess are bird calls. We'll just call them alien bird calls, because <laughs> I've never heard a bird that sound anywhere close to that. And then the Suntaran getting taken in by the plant. It's good. It's fun. It's interesting. It's silly. I really had a good time. Why does the Doctor have an enormous carnivorous plant <laughs> in the TARDIS? Why not? Why not? I, okay. Exactly. Fair. And also the Doctor does a slightly bastardized version of Colonel Bogey's March. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I did notice that and had money on <laughs> you mentioning it, Julie. So I will claim my $50. Thank you. <laughs> not for me. You didn't bet me. 
<laughs> no, I just move it from my savings account to my checking account. It's fine. It was a bet with myself. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's try to get towards the end here because we've been yeah, talking. Yeah, we're a getting long there. Time. We have a lot. Yeah. So we find out that it's a weapon and it's a DMAT gun. Ooh. Big whoop. I don't <laughs> understand what the big deal is about this gun. No, me neither. As I already said, <laughs> but the doctor doesn't waste any time in killing a Suntarn with it. He's very rooty tooty point and shooty in this serial. Yes, he is. And it's off-putting, to be quite honest with you, all joking aside. Just doesn't feel right for me. It's out of character. And then I guess we can move forward to it. We have the big showdown with Storr. He has, all of a sudden, we are now dealing with the, him holding a grenade that could blow up everything. Right yeah. in the last scene, of the last act. The inference I got was that it's because it's literally above the Matrix and ah, okay, the chain that's reaction would cause the Matrix and the Panopticon to blow up, which would cause Gallifrey to blow up, which would cause a whole galaxy to blow up, which is pretty petty of store. <laughs> yes. Especially considering that, as the Doctor points out, it would kill that whole Suntaran fleet, but I think it's been emphasized on particularly in this serial, that the Suntarans are kind of disposable. Oh, and they're glad to do it because it's for the greater yeah. cause, which is war. Sunta ha motherfuckers. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we have the doctor just point and shooting. We have the, okay, the wisdom of Rassilon to make sure he doesn't remember what he did because reasons. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I was not big on that too. Like, uh, mm. I don't like, in general, when they do things where somehow we've blocked the Doctor from remembering his past. Like, oh, wait, <clears throat> the child thing. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't make sense to me. Yeah, I'm with you. It's a cheap way of avoiding having to worry about continuity moving forward. Continuity and consequences. Yeah, that too. Yeah. So, all right. Let's talk about it. Yeah. I know this is going to be devastating for Riley in particular. Okay. Well, I will just go ahead and get this first part out of the way. Andred? Yeah. No. <laughs> I was waiting for the Andred isn't worthy take. Him? I feel like Bateman in Arrested Development. Her? Him? <laughs> like, uh, I, I mean, she... no, it's... Ooh, and the, the thing that Andred seems, I guess, a fine guy. But did I just miss... That being developed completely throughout the entire serial, I felt like they just got thrown in at the end. Like there was, how many lines did they share? There was one hand holding moment, and I think it was uh. after he got shot. Yeah, once he gets oh. shot in the arm, there's, mm. apparently that wasn't even scripted, the moments of tenderness. That was Louise Jameson and the guy who played Andred basically saying, well, shit, I guess we better do something to try oh, and make God. this credible oh. since they've decided to write it like this. Because for me, I don't like the Andrew thing, mainly because she really got along with the non-Time Lords, whatever they're called here. I forget exactly what we're calling them. Yeah. Yeah, because they're basically her people. They are savages. So I figured that she would join them. Right. That would have made more sense to me because she could have been like, you know what? It was fun with the doctor, but I want to be back with people like me, which mm -hmm. to be fair, like after you've lived a certain number of years, you know, I get it. And all that. But no, that's not what we did. We just decided Andred, because why not? Yeah, it's hastily thrown together. I will just say that I'm not as upset as I could have been because the character seems to be okay. It wasn't anything badly done to her. She wasn't given a bad death. I And her memory wasn't taken away? Yeah, she has full memory of everything. I don't know if she'll be happy there. As you kind of alluded to, Julie, because she's with the Time Lords. But there's a lot worse situations that could have happened, and it could have been done even worse than this. So I guess I'm just grateful that it wasn't, which I guess isn't saying much. But while the Doctor does not lock her out to the TARDIS, she is still effectively getting Susaned. Mm. That's, yeah. yeah. She is getting left behind with a guy that she barely knows. It's not great. But she's not alone. There's K9. Yeah. The best That's the boy. other one. The best mm -hmm. boy. I don't blame him. The doctor was kind of mean to him this whole serial. And if I were to choose an owner, I would choose Leela. Mm. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And we really end the episode with the doctor breaking the fourth wall again. Again. <sighs> Anthony, I have to know. Okay. This is the end of season 15. Yes. You 
I believe, warned me about this. That the show runners lose control of Baker. Is it going to get more out of control? I would say it's going to get better, and then it's going to get worse, and then it's going to get better again. Okay, so there will at least be a respite. We're not just going straight into crazy town. Okay, good. Without meaning to give too many spoilers away, I think they keep him relatively under control next season. Season 17, I think, is peak Tom Baker ego. And then season 18 is back to Tom Baker being under control again. Okay. All right. Okay, we can deal with that. We can handle that. We can work with it. (laughs) All right. So we've got Canine Mark II, and that's the end of our story. As a very quick recap, I made it 16 Jelly Babies. That sounds right to me. (laughs) Which is more than we've had in the rest of the season put together. (laughs) We had a one on Quarry Query. We have zero on I'll Explain Later. Camp count points. What are we giving on the camp count? I feel like Barusa has a little bit of campiness to him. He would have even more if he were played by (laughs) Kenneth Williams. Oh, yes, he would. (laughs) I think the story only needs like one or two. I don't think it's very camp. We're going to give it two. All right. right. So two camp count points. We will go ahead and rate this now. And Julie, you get to start this time. Lucky you. Lucky me, because I honestly don't know where I stand on this, <laughs> to be perfectly honest. <laughs> it starts off slow. It starts off wrong. And it took me a while to really get into the story. I agree with Riley in that it gets better all the way through the end, minus the breaking the fourth wall. That's terrible. I like some of the music choices. I like some of the actors. I do like a lot of things. The design of the Vardens is awful. And (laughs) there's just no other way of putting it. So it's a roller coaster, to be perfectly honest. But it's something where maybe I'll just skip the first two episodes and then I can watch the last four episodes again and not hate myself. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> no, I, I would have fun, guys. It's not that bad. But I'm giving it so hard. Five and a half Doc Tours <laughs> out of ten. Doc Tour. <laughs> Riley, I'll let you go next. Julie's right. This one's all over the place. I enjoyed it, except for the first two episodes. But it's true. And I'll just be short about it. What do I like about it? I think the music's good. I think our interactions between the Doctor and Barusa, Doctor and Kellner, are very good. I think that Leela gets a lot of love in this episode, other than a lazily written out ending, but there's a lot of celebration of her character, I feel like, throughout the serial, so I really appreciate that. The humor is quite fun, and that takes off at the end of part two and just keeps getting better. The energy comes on towards the end. I have to say, if I was to watch this again, I would probably do what Julie just said. I would probably (laughs) skip the first two episodes, other than maybe just see some Leela scenes, and that would be it. So I had a great time, to be quite honest with you. So I'm going to give this seven and a half Finkel Grubers out of ten. Wow. Wow. Okay, that's unexpected. And that leaves it with me. And I have to say, there were times watching this where I struggled. There were times when watching this that I was really enjoying it as well. I mentioned parts three and four I thought were great. And the interaction between the Doctor and the Time Lords, and between the Time Lords and the Time Lords, are some of my favourite things in this story. I think the Vardens are a very weak villain. I think the makeup and the prosthetics (laughs) on these Sontarans are awful. Those first two parts are pretty hard going. But yeah, there's a lot that's actually quite fun here. And by God, I've had a good time talking about this, which is more than can be said for some other stories this season. So this isn't the worst, but it's certainly not the best we've seen. I personally probably give this six and a half baked potatoes of Rassilon (laughs) out of 10, which gives us a story average of six and a half. Can I do a thing that I never do? Sure. Can I go up to six? Yes, you can. I'll go up to six. I can be convinced. And that bumps <laughs> up our story average to 6.67, which, a little bit of a spoiler for next time when we do our season retrospective, makes it our second highest rated story of the season. Wow. After Underworld. So we are fully embracing <laughs> our controversial era here. <laughs> so on that bombshell, we're going to call it a night. Next time, as I just mentioned, we'll be back with our season 15 retrospective. God help us all. (laughs) 
<laughs> but in the meantime, thank you so very much to everyone for listening. And of course, as always, have a good one. You have been listening to Watchers in the Fourth Dimension with Riley Shrek, Julie Philippek, and myself, Anthony Williams. This episode, Effectively Getting Susaned, was recorded on Tuesday the 12th of March 2024. If this is your first time listening into the show, all of our previous episodes are available wherever you'd like to get your podcasts. You can interact with us on Facebook, Instagram, and X at at Watchers4D, and you can also email us at Watchers4D at gmail.com. If you're enjoying the show, please do subscribe and consider leaving us a review or rating on your favorite podcasting app. All of those things really do help the show. And always remember, if the world is making it too difficult to make your season finale, just end the season early, damn it!